So now I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts and chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 44 and onwards. Last time, I read from verse 39 and concentrated on those first few verses. And so in a way, following on from last message, I'm going to pick it up from verse 44 and talk about it. Last time, I talked about the churches as being grace communities. And now we're going to see how grace overflows out of our lives to reach other people because we're not just grace communities. Churches are also mission communities. We are sent by the Master into the world to represent Him. Verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in, his t in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Grace communities, wonderful to know that we have been transferred from the power and the domain of darkness, which is how men and women in the world find themselves before accepting Jesus. Taken from that domain and placed into another domain, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God's love, light, truth, power, and grace, and in this kingdom, we serve together as communities. The church is the community of those who are in the kingdom of God. It's not just uh, one moment here. Help. One moment. The church is a community of those who've surrendered to the kingdom of God and to the rule of God. Keep looking at me. She's just having a cough and a drink. Okay. <laughs> really, I'm more interesting. <laughs> if not, please pretend. <laughs> and uh, if you uh, move from one domain to another domain, there must be a boundary. And I think it's important in these days to establish that boundary. It's a boundary of belief and behavior. Those in the church believe Christ and obey Christ. Those in the world may be reaching for some better way of living or searching for the spiritual dimension in their lives, but they've not yet believed. And therefore, the best they can do is fulfill their behavior or live in a way according to what they believe. But there is a boundary. And these boundaries are being eradicated today. And so there is sometimes less of a difference between men and women in the world, what they believe and how they behave, with those in the church, what, what we believe and what we behave, how we behave. And so it's so important for us to understand that there are conditions for this community. A community is a group of people that have a common purpose, who meet and share in a common place and have common possessions. And we see all those things described in these verses. These people were believers. They, their, their values were, were the teachings of the apostles. And the apostles' doctrine is not just reciting the creeds as important as those are. It's about having our lives shaped according to the values of the kingdom of God, which boils down to very real choices about how we live and what we, what we, what, how we conduct ourselves in the world and the standards that we follow. 
And our society at this time is, seems to be hell-bent, and I use the word deliberately, on breaking down those boundaries and actually telling the church that we cannot believe these things because, because they're ridiculous or untrue or, or unloving and, and, and rejecting of others. But the fact is, is that you have been transferred from one kingdom into another kingdom and we live not by the rules of Moses or by the rules of morality or even by the rules of church, church principles. We live by one rule. That's the rule and reign of God in our lives. And we surrender our lives to the Lord of Jesus. Amen. amen and amen. amen. How significant it is that we see this group of people, they were together. They were together in church fellowship. One of the most natural expressions of church is our gathering. How we gather together at lots of different levels. The two or three gathered in the name of Jesus, there is in the midst. The gatherings of the groups in the cell meetings and the gatherings in our congregational services, our celebration services, and from time to time, gathering all together in the biggest building, the biggest bucket we can find in London. But it's all about gathering together unto Him. But it's important for us to know that it doesn't end there. No sooner have we been gathered unto Christ and acknowledge who, who we are and how we live and how we are shaping our lives by the grace of God to be more like Jesus and how we rest under the security of God's grace with an indelible, irretrievable ticket for heaven, a certainty that we are going to be with Christ forever. No sooner as we've realized these things, then God says, right now, I need you to know something else. You are not just a grace community but you are a mission community. I send you back into the world. Not to be part of it, not to be like it, but to be in it. Jesus says, in the world, but not of the world. This is salt and light. Where it is needed, light needs to shine in the darkness. Salt needs to be applied to, to bring flavor and to check corruption in the meat. This is who we are. So we can't just sit back and relax under the security of the grace of God and have our little holy parties. We need also to hear the voice from heaven saying, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. God, after all, is the great sending God. He always is a sending God because He's a giving God. The climax of it, of course, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave or sent His only Son into the world. God loves the world. He's never given up on the world. Never given up on the world. And His, his heart of love causes Him to send. Somebody once said, God had only one son and made him a missionary. <laughs> Do you think he'll have any lesser plan for us who are adopted sons and daughters of God? No, we are all missionaries. We are sent into the world. And I'm not saying you have to don a pith helmet, a khaki jacket, and khaki shorts with knobbly knees and lean against some palm tree in Africa sipping homemade lemonade in order to be a missionary. Right now where you are, you are there because God has sent you there. Hmm? God, the sending God. It begins with Abraham. God said to Abraham, as he was called then, go to a land that I will show you. And he was the first missionary, translocal missionary. And he crossed from Ur of the Chaldees. He went north and then came back down south into, Har into uh, the land of Canaan where God said, look around, I'm going to give you this place. And it wasn't just that God was singling out Abraham. He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. God had a plan and a purpose to raise up the Jewish nation that would be the vehicle for the coming of Christ the Messiah. And so much of the Old Testament story is how God preserved that nation. And God kept that nation pure and distinct so that that nation could be a light to the nations. Because God also said to Abraham, in you shall all 
the families of the earth be blessed. God is a missionary God. He has a heart for all the nations. He loves the peoples of the world, and he loves them enough to bring them here to Kensington Temple, 119 of you, different nationalities. Hallelujah. I got a bit carried away in the 9 o'clock service. I was speaking, uh, speaking French and, and Swahili and a few other languages as well. And when I, when I lost vocabulary, I started speaking in tongues. But we'll just stick with English today. Huh? C'est beaucoup mieux ça. Oop. But we are wonderful nationalities here. And I love it. I love it. I love it. That's why I get carried away so easily. Because I was born in Africa, brought up in Australia, have a passion for England. I've got to say that, haven't I? I can't, I can't refuse that. Um, and, uh, but, and also feel that I'm myself I'm a citizen of the world and travel different nations on your behalf because as we have people from all over the world, you know, an invitation to go and preach anywhere in the world is, isn't hard. What is hard is to decide where God wants you to be at any particular time. But the fact is we share this together. It's one of the big... Um, messages of this church that so many nations and nationalities are one in Christ Jesus. And we don't have issues with racism in this church. We don't have issues with uh, rejecting or accepting other people's cultures. The hardest thing I've ever had to accept in this church when it comes to the cultures was the Ethiopian eggs. I'm sorry those Ethiopian eggs they used to bring. Not all the way from Ethiopia, but it was the recipe. They were hotter than hell, I can tell you. <laughs> That's the only thing. Everything else has been wonderful and easy. I, uh, so God is this great sending God. He sent Abraham, and of course, after that, he sent Joseph. Joseph, he sent him into Egypt because God was wanting to preserve during a time of family, uh, during a time of famine, that family bloodline so that the Messiah could be born. And when we say Joseph was sent, let's spell it out what it really meant. First of all, he was betrayed by his brothers, thrown in a pit. That's God's first step of sending. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't say amen, just say ouch. Uh, and then, of course, if things got better, his own brothers rescued him from the pit and then sold him to the Midianites as a slave out of the frying pan into the fire. That's what it was. So he served as a slave, uh, and that was God sending him. Uh, and then it got worse because he was accused falsely and then sent to prison. But even in prison, he was called. He was God's man for that place. Because there was a call on his life. The God of heaven said, I have a plan and a purpose to send you. It may look like a snakes and ladders journey. Do you know snakes and ladders? You ever played that game as a kid? It's my favorite one at Christmas. And Monopoly gets me too worked up. So snakes and ladders. But you take a few steps and a wonderful ladder comes along and you meet a snake and it slides you down. Don't worry about it. If you've never heard about this, it is not in the Bible. Okay, never mind. <laughs> But you feel like it's zigzag, up, down, and you don't know where you are. But God has a plan. He knows exactly every step that you should take. And sometimes it seems bad, and sometimes it seems worse, and sometimes it seems worser and badder than before. But God says, my hand is on your life. You are my ambassador. I have a purpose for you, and I'm sending you into the world. And then he became prime minister. I wonder if um, David Cameron had to go through all those steps. And <laughs> maybe God's plan of getting us where we should be is a little more complicated than just sending us to Eton. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you've got to get eaten by our circumstances. <laughs> I mean, well, don't look at me like that as if I'm making it up. What about Jonah? Uh -huh. He was swallowed up, no doubt, by his circumstances, but God coughed him up on the right shore at the right time, saying, I'm sending you to the Ninevites. Moses was sent into Egypt to rescue God's people out of Egypt and to lead them to be a worshiping community in the wilderness and ultimately to enter into the promised land. God is ascending God from beginning to end. If we have a look at a verse from Scripture, Jeremiah 7 and verse 25, this is how God, the sending God, has always worked. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, 
I have even sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising up early and sending them. So God is this continual sending God. He sent Abraham, he sent Joseph, he sent Moses, and he sent all the prophets to, to preserve these two things, to say God's people must live right to be a light to the nations, but living right means also shining your light to the nations. And here's this image. I like the way the Bible uses anthropomorphic imagery, in other words, describing God in human terms so we can understand. And we know that God never sleeps, all right? He that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Amen and amen? Yeah, okay, but it says this God rises early, daily. So God gets up early. <laughs> well, if you never sleep, I suppose that's, that's not too difficult. But the picture here is of, uh, of a person who wakes up early with a purpose. Have you ever woken up like that recently? Try it tomorrow morning, <laughs> Monday morning. Wake up, oh, what a new day, oh God. You have a purpose for my life. Somebody is excited about doing something. Somebody is not just work, waking up saying, oh, what day is it? Who cares anyway? Oh, Monday, oh, woo, yeah. Oh, never mind. Yeah, yeah, five days and then it'll be Friday and after that it'll be Sunday. Oh. <laughs> He wakes up early. In other words, he has a purpose. And his motivation is this, I love the world. I'm waking up with fresh love for the world. God doesn't actually wake up. It's a picture. It's a metaphor. But it's like saying it's so important to him. Is that how you wake up every morning? God, I love the world and I'm in it. I'm not of it. I'm in it. What are you sending me to do today? Who are, you ascend, who are you ascending across my path today that I can be your representative and serve them with the love of Jesus? Amen and amen. That was Swahili for in the name of Jesus. Okay, if you don't know Swahili, hakuna matata, no problem. All right. Now we know that the climax of this heavenly missionary strategy was God sending his son. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. First of all, fullness of time, it means He came right on schedule. This master plan of the lover of the universe to, to, to send the Savior into the world, this master plan had been developed in the eternity past, and carefully implemented step by step, stage by stage, till this very point. Genesis 3.15 was the first word of gospel promise. Right there in the middle of the curse, God says, the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head, and he shall bruise his heel. This is a picture of the cross, where on the cross, Jesus defeated, destroyed, drove out, and disarmed the enemy decisively and forever. And he, his heel was bruised. Yes, it was by suffering and death that he achieved this. But when he died on the cross, he didn't say, I'm extinguished, I'm finished, it's all over, game over. He said, no, devil, it's game over for you. All is accomplished. Amen and amen. So God was preparing the world for the right time for the coming of Jesus. In the missions course, we look how that happens historically with the Roman Empire, the Greek language, which was the common language of commerce right across the whole of the Roman Empire with the Roman roads and this relative security of the Pax Romana, the, the peace that Rome had brought to the world. And all of these were ideal conditions upon which the gospel could, could travel into all of the parts of the world. Everything was in place, and I love that, because you see, the God who is in charge of such detail historically is also the same God who is in charge of the personal details of our lives. He's working out His purpose. Amen. In West Africa, they say, sit down for you. You go well with the righteous. <laughs> Amen. 
Everybody say, it go well with the righteous. Now you're speaking Creole. Dudley, where's Dudley? Dudley, give me a camera here. Give me a camera here. Come on, come on. Come closer. I'm not scary. Oh, there you are. All right. Dudley, it go well with the righteous. <laughs> See, Dudley's from Sierra Leone. That's the, the Creole they use there. And we can. We can relax and take this, the pressure off and know that God is working out His purpose, especially to those who are called and obedient to His call. Amen. Sent by Jesus into the world. So when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, this is remarkable. Because the fact that Jesus was born under the law, which meant he was a Jewish law keeper, he was the only one who kept the law of Moses in detail. And because he kept it, he, he, he kept it for us. Did you know that? So that we could be saved by his righteousness. The law has been fulfilled in Christ. That is our righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. So he was qualifying to be our Savior. He didn't just die for us but he first lived for us and gave us the gift of his righteousness in exchange for our unworthiness and our unrighteousness. But before that, there's this phrase, born of a woman. Interesting. If we only have the first part of the verse, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. No more. How would you imagine it? God's son. Well, God is the ruler, the creator of all things. His son is his e this eternal relationship that exists within the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. So much part of himself. And this must be such an important person. God gave his very best. And that in giving us Jesus, he's given us all things. For he who did not spare his only son, how shall he not also along with him freely give us all things? And so you'd think there'd at least be a red carpet. A red carpet coming from heaven. What's this? Gabriel on one side, some other archangel on the other side, and maybe our own Gabriel somewhere back there, I don't know. <laughs> coming down from heaven, golden steps. He would, have, he would have come with royal robes and majesty and glory and say, I am the Son of God. Finally, I have arrived. But that's not the plan of God. He had to come and be born as a man. We're thinking of this at Christmas, weren't we? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's how He was sent into the world, to become one of us, to become part of us. With, ev with sin being the only exception, He experienced everything that we go through. The joys of human life, the pains and sorrows of human life. And because of this, he is so merciful and so gracious to understand that my Jesus, even now in heaven, clothed in flesh, human, human, holy and human, but touched with the feelings of our infirmities, a gracious, compassionate high priest who knows what you're going through because God sent him to dwell with us in this world and to take on our nature so that he could understand us and take us from where we are and lift us into the heavenly kingdom of God. Wonderful story of incarnation. And in the same way, that God's Word became flesh into this world, so you and I must take on this world and in a way incarnate Jesus, in a way, so that He is first formed in us that we might show Him to the world. One famous missionary personality in, the, in church history said, wherever you go, preach Christ, and use words only when necessary. He must first be seen in us before he will be heard through us. Matthew 5, 16, it says, Jesus says, let your light shine before men 
or so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying this is what's so important, that Christ should be seen in us. And good works are a very important part of our life. Uh, somebody said, well, what, what are good works? Doing good things? Yeah, I suppose, but it's a bit stronger than that. A good work, in Bible language, is any act or actions that we do out of love for the benefit of other people as we meet their needs. That's a good work. And he said, get out there. Do good works. As Paul says in Titus 2, be zealous for good works. That's what grace does. Grace fills us with the assurance that God loves us and that unconditionally He's accepted us through Christ as we put our faith in Him. And that begins to shape us into, into holy living and that life of love begins to be formed in us and it will inevitably lead to a passionate pursuit of service and of good works. That's, that's, God's, that's God's pattern. That's how it works. And I think the word service or serving is the best way to describe the mission of Jesus. If we are sent into the world as Jesus was sent into the world, what did that look like? He became a servant. He is the servant king. He is called the servant of the Lord. Everything he did was in service to the Father and in service to humanity. The servant. That's what the kingdom is. We are also called to be the servant church. Did you know that? The servant mission of Jesus has been given to the church. The light to the nations is the servant of God. And we corporately are the servant of God. And mission communities are servants of God into our world, sent into our world. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Luke chapter 22, verse 27, Jesus makes this point very strongly. Luke 22, verse 27, he says, For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? It is not he who sits at the table, or is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I'm among you as the one who serves. And so what Jesus is saying here, you're in, sitting in a restaurant and the waiter comes. Have you noticed how you, you have to almost throw your bread roll at the waiter sometimes to get attention? It's amazing. You can be sitting here and the waiter is over there and you're trying to catch his eye. And he has a wonderful way of going, Have you ever been like that? It, it, uh, any, any waiters here today? Any waiters? You're not ready to own up, are you? <laughs> but the idea is, is that when you sit down, you're the master. You're the important person. You're the customer. You're the paying customer. Panyaraka. Nataka kula chukula. Maramoja. Any Swahili speakers here? <laughs> Anybody got the interpretation? Say it loud. Come here quickly and give me food. Maramoja, right away. Wow, my Swahili is improving. <laughs> but we like that, aren't we? And we, we, you know, I don't know. I must confess, maybe I'm confessing too much today. <laughs> so I ask my wife just to put out a red flag when I'm going too far. Too much confession for the pastor is not good for the church, okay? <laughs> but sometimes I feel important, especially in a fancy restaurant. I feel important. I'm, I'm important. I'm going to pay. I'll cry later, but I'll enjoy it now. <laughs> I expect them to treat me as important. And if you are a restaurant owner and a 
you know, in a service industry, you know how important it is to make the customer feel important. Even in the kitchen, you say, crazy man. <laughs> and so logically, the person who is serving the one sitting at the table is the lesser. And the one at the table is more important. And Jesus turns it on his head and he said, yet, I am among you as one who serves. One who serves. And this servant-heartedness and humbleness of mind and heart is the only way to fulfill our mission in the world. John Stott, Christian Mission in the Modern World, says, now he sends us, he says, as the Father had sent him. Therefore, our mission, like his, is to be one of service. He emptied himself of status and took the form of a servant, and his humble mind is to be in us. When we think about that, we realize that the long-standing argument between those who favor mission and evangelism against those who favor mission and social action. And it's strange that we're arguing about this. Why is it either one or the other? It's both and, surely. We are to do both, and both are humble acts of service. If we love somebody, the most important thing we'd ever wish to communicate to them is that God loves them and Jesus died for them. Friendship will never s cause us to hold back when it comes to sharing the truth. Sometimes it's not easy because the gospel is offensive. Have you noticed in conversation how a lot of people will be quite happy to talk about God? Not everybody, of course. God, because that covers a multitude of religions. God. But the moment you talk about Jesus, the fangs come out. <laughs> people turn into werewolves straight away. <laughs> because the issue is not just about believing in God. It's about believing in Jesus. Jesus said, you believe in the, in the Father, believe also in me, because no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. Amen. And so, sometimes it's difficult. When we look in the early church preaching, it was not a lot of hellfire preaching. Don't misunderstand me, hear me through, but it was not a lot of hellfire preaching. They didn't stand up and saying, you snakes and sinners burn in hell, turn or burn. They didn't do that. But the whole preaching was set in the context of the judgment of God. And ultimately, the message was flee from the wrath that is to come. So they didn't downplay it. But even to the degree to which it's necessary to communicate that the grace of God is only relevant when we are under God's judgment. We wouldn't need grace if there was no judgment. People have to understand that. You have to understand that when you're saved, you're not just saved for a happier life. You're saved from sin. And you have to forsake sin in order to be saved by grace. You have to turn your back on that stuff. It's not about saying, I'll take Christ and add him to my life. I've got me, here I am, plus Christ. And when it's me, it's me, me, me. When I'm in trouble, it's plus Christ. It's all or nothing. And we have to explain that. And when we talk about the gospel, the response to the gospel, of course, is to believe in Jesus. Believe and you shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, that is salvation. But that is only the beginning. Because salvation and knowing Jesus as Savior is never divorced from knowing Jesus as Lord. He is Savior and Lord. You get to know the one who has saved you more and more and discover that this one who saved you has all authority and he has a right to speak into your life, to speak over your life, and to, 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 to tell you and to lead you in the paths 
which are right, and we surrender to Him. It's not easy. It's not just like saying, oh, I don't have to think anymore. The Bible says this is right and that's wrong. I don't have to think. Today, in the moral maze and the complexities of 21st century living, we have to use every ounce of our understanding of the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, together with Christian thinking as to which is the way to behave under these set of circumstances. It's, it's, it doesn't mean to say we don't have to think, but we know, ultimately, our lives come under the Lordship of Jesus. So when we're sharing the gospel, there are some tough things to say. But nevertheless, love will give us the confidence to share the truth. But it's not just about talking. You see, it's very simple. The gospel lacks visibility if we only preach it. And it lacks credibility if those who preach it do not do so out of love. How can we fail to preach if we love? And how can we fail to love if we preach? The two go together. And so, God has sent us into the world as an act and expression of His love, which is carried in our hearts, in the same way that Jesus loved, by serving serving the needs of everybody, particularly, deeply, their spiritual needs. So this same love will drive us back into the world to be authentic expressions of Christ to a lost and needy world. To love as He loved. <laughs> and to serve as He served. Not just to preach good news, but to be good news. As I say, to incarnate Christ. I don't mean that literally. But to incarnate Christ, to show Him in our bodies and in our lives. And to show His gospel by our lives. And through the acts of genuine love and service for the hurting, the broken, the lost, the disenfranchised. Just as the Lord Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us, so we must take on the world and dwell among them. Jesus was in the world, but not of the world. And in the same way, having rescued us from the world, he said, guess what? You're going right back there. This time, you're going as a minister. Are you ready to be ordained very soon? Okay. As a minister and a missionary to represent me to the world, to show them that I'm alive, that I've made a difference in your life, and that you love them. The opportunities are endless. That's why in this church we have a saying, your occupation is the location for your true vocation. Your occupation is the location for your true vocation. Every calling is a holy calling. Because there is no part of this world that God is not interested in. People talk about the secular world. Mais le monde secular n'existe pas devant Dieu. Because he owns everything. There's no such thing as secular except sin. That's the only thing God rejects, sin. So whether we're talking about arts, education, media, business, finance, commerce, geography, topography, campanology, <laughs> anything, and if everything, it's His world. This is God's world. He created it. It's Christ's world. He died for it, and it's our world because we're sent to reach it. If only I had a device, if I had a visit from Gabriel the angel and said, Colin, I'm giving you a ministry, here's a device. When you turn it to the right, everybody's minds lines up. So I'm going to give you the ultimate tool to manipulate people's minds. Don't worry about this. I, I'm, not, I'm not really going to try it. Okay. But if I had this, 
I would set it from where it is now, our thinking, that church is about me, to set it to be church is about them. I would just go <laughs> like that, if I could. Of course, I can't do that. Uh, it would be manipulation anyway, but it's not manipulation when I persuade from the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit that that is exactly the case. You need to have your mind remu renewed by the Word of God, your mind renewed. Church is not it. We are called as the church to be in the world to represent Christ in our daily life. Some will be called further afield. But we're all called to begin in Jerusalem. Now, before you buy a ticket and catch an aeroplane, <laughs> Jerusalem is where you are now. Tell everybody, London is Jerusalem. No, 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 don't, because they're going to think you're crazy, all right? <laughs> They'll send you back to geography class. But it's better to say, London is my Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. And when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on me, I'll be a witness to Christ, first of all, in my Jerusalem. Jerusalem is your brother, your sister, the people you share your house with. Jerusalem is the people that you meet every day on the way to work and at work and outside of work and, and in college. Jerusalem is where God has placed you now. Amen. 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 And if you think about it, some of you will be able to say, do you know what, that's weird. Because I didn't exactly take the same route as Joseph, but I had a pretty strange route to get here. In fact, I don't even know how I'm here. Well, I know how I'm here, but it, I never planned it, but God has put me here. Yes, you better believe it. God has put you here to make a difference. Amen. Amen. Sent into the world. Your occupation where you work is the location where you have been sent. Your true vocation is what you've been called to do. To love, to serve, and to testify to the truth. Amen. And your true vocation is to call men and women to Christ... To, to, to surrender to Christ who has first, first been seen in you. If you say to somebody, I want to tell you about Jesus, and they say, where is he? <laughs> You've lost it. But if you say, I want to tell, some, tell you about Jesus, they'll say, I'm not surprised because I see him in you. Yeah. See him in you. Now you say, I, I don't intend to make you respond like feeling guilty today. Don't feel guilty. Nothing to feel guilty about. Feel powerless. That's a better emotion. Because we can't do this. Don't feel guilty. Feel powerless. Feel, God, it's impossible. How can I do this? He says, ah, I'm glad you asked me. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you shall be my witnesses. Come, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. <laughs> it's Christ in you. We can't do this on our own. I'll tell you what. Most mornings, I wake up feeling not so spiritual. I can never be spiritual until Amanda brings me a cup of tea. <laughs> After that first sip... A little bit of spirituality returns. <laughs> and the odd occasion when I reverse the, the pleasure and bring her a cup of tea, on those occasions I felt so spiritual <laughs> even before I woke up. <laughs> I'm so glad that we're human and He is divine. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be not of us, but of God. It's about His anointing. Do you know what? People should look at your life and say, how did you do that? And you look back and say, I have no idea. <laughs> it must be God. This is true supernatural living. And do you know what? Supernatural living comes into its own when we obey the call to go. You don't need staying power when you're staying. You need staying power when you're going. We sit in our services, Oh God, fill me a new Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome. And the Holy Spirit is, 
when are you going to do something? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of power, of movement, of activity. Get going and the power will hit you. You can never run faster than the power of God. Step out and you will meet him there. Oh, finally. You asked me to come. I'm waiting for you in the car park. When you get out of the car park, say, okay, let's go into a glorious week, the first day of the week, waking up early every morning. God, here am I. Send me. I already have done so. What do you want me to do today? I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. Love and serve and influence those around you. Katika jina la Yesu. So, who are the real harvest fields? Here we have a picture here of the harvest fields, but I'll tell you what it really looks like. It really looks like this. The Bible says, just in case you can't see, it's a picture of Portobello Road. Portobello Market. Amen. Now, are you ready? To, she wants to go shopping. <laughs> oh, the market, I must buy some things. You see, the Bible says, the field is the world, and the world is not about, it's not geographic. It's the world of people. Millions of them. Billions of them. Last time I counted was six billion. And then I had to count, I had another billion. Is that right? Are we seven billion yet? And that's not even the baby's about to pop out. <laughs> I mean, it's happening everywhere. And you see these people, Portobello Market, it's a bit of a slice of London. You will find people from everywhere in the world right there. And Portobello is a good place to go. We do go there, but you have a Portobello Market, the marketplace of your life where your stall is set out every day. And you are touching people every single day. And you have been sent into the world, not to be of the world, but to be in it, to serve and demonstrate Christ. That is the call of God upon our lives, and that is our true purpose of being. Now, you all know that we have a strategy, which we call the... the uh, a principle of 12 strategy in building cell groups into every part of London so that we can give you some framework upon which you can, can do this, through which you can do it. The strategy is not infallible, and the strategy never works on its own anyway. We have to get up and move with it and be ready. But it will not happen until we accept that we are missionaries. So here comes the moment. It's going to be very quick. You might miss it unless you focus very quickly. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ordain you as minister missionaries. Amen. Done. <laughs> Done. In fact, all I did was proclaim what he's already done. <laughs> so I cheated there. I was sneaky. He's already ordained you as a minister to serve a missionary to be sent to whatever world. It might be pagan or secular. It might be indifferent or open. It might be religious or irreligious, but lost anyway. See yourself as a missionary. Number two, listen to them. One of the reasons Jesus came to be where we are, to sit where we sit, so we could listen. You can't talk unless you've listened. It's not a one-way conversation. This is a two-way conversation. He was concerned about people's lives. How long has the boy been like this? Tell me the story. What's happening? He entered into people's lives by listening and making a connection. We have to learn to listen. Thoughts, what people are thinking, what they're feeling, what are their frustrations, what are their fears, what are their hopes, what are their prejudices, what are their... What are the things that we need to apologize for on behalf of Christianity? I know every time I have a meaningful conversation with a Muslim, I will apologize on behalf of Christianity for the false gospel that was spread by the sword during the time of the Crusades. I'll, of course, also talk about the 300 years where Islam was spread by the sword. So, but that's, I'm, I don't have to apologize for their religion. Where they've gone wrong, I can apologize because that was not Jesus. That was not Jesus. Sometimes you have to apologize for the poor standard that there is in the church when our lives are no different. Hey, you, 
Well, join you, I've got enough problems. That's what somebody said, invited to a church. What? Go in there. If they're all as miserable as you, I don't want to go in there. Anyway, I've got enough problems of my own. I want, don't want more. Now, I'm not beating us up. I'm just saying there is, sometimes there's a lot of apologizing to do and showing that Jesus is not like they've been treated by people calling themselves Christians. Do you agree with me? Sometimes that's true. So see yourself as a missionary. Listen to their needs. Num listen to them. Number four, discover their needs and where possible serve them. And we can do that so often. I mean, in, in, in the office. And I, I, re I remember this. When I, when I go anywhere, I'm an invader. I'm a stranger. If I go to an office, apart from my own office, and as far as I know, I think most of our staff are just about saved. I think I'm, you know. That was irony. Yes, of course, they're saved. So it, I go back to the time when I was working outside of the church. And I made a stand for Jesus, and I was ridiculed and had a lot of fun. Some of it was very funny, and I joined in. The joke was against me, but that was, I like humor in whatever form it comes. And then after a while, something happened. They began to come and share the deeper needs of their life. And sometimes even the most shall we say, unlikely people said, shh, Philip, please pray for me. Please pray for you? Of course. Of course. And wherever we can to be a listening ear. There is so much wisdom in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We can help people even before we convert them. We can be there for them. And sometimes we get together and we can structure ourselves as a church and link with other churches to do stuff we could never do on our own. Programs of outreach, social care, taking care of the poor and the needy. This dry food offering that you're going to bring on Wednesday will be distributed to the elderly. And the Christmas donation that you give is buying child uh, presents for children in the families in our borough who would never get anything for Christmas. The social services gives us the name or the list or the number and they distribute for us. For those kids, the only church they experience is a present from at Christmas from you, from Kensington Temple, getting involved in local schools, volunteering, being on the board of governors, not as an interfering nanny type personality, but as somebody who genuinely wants to serve, getting involved in neighborhood watch. I was part of the neighborhood watch. I felt like a really, really important person. I don't quite know what I was watching, but. <laughs> there were so few people, and most of them complained to the policeman, we want speed bumps in this area. That's all they came out to, to lobby. I said, aren't we here to help? What can we do to help? And you sit to look at the policeman's face. He treated me like an angel, like, oh, thank God there's somebody who's rescued me out of this. <laughs> so I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you very much. I was his friend for life. Because it was about serving. Are you getting the picture, ladies and gentlemen? I'm not saying you're not doing it already. No, please, please don't think that. I'm just wanting you to relish this wonderful call that God has given us. We are called out of the world and sent back into it to serve it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen.